is having table right now in the library until five o'clock. So if you're looking for lovely jewelry, they would very much appreciate your support. Also on Wednesday this week, we have our big concert at Trudeau Park, the Bag Street Klezmer Band on our new stage. So please come and join us. It's supposed to be a nice day, not too hot, no tornadoes, please come. And also on this Thursday, we continue our Bright Lights Film Club. We are screening The Whale, the 2022 film. I also wanna remind everyone to please turn off your cell phones. And now without further ado, here is Dr. Joe Schwartz with Science Demystified. And that is the voice from the great ether out there. All right. So uh, I think uh, interesting topic for you guys here today, and it really fits into our you know usual theme of separating sense from uh, from nonsense, and um, it's a discussion that is very very current, as you'll see as we get near the second part of the the talk. But what we're gonna talk about here are psychedelics. And this is a word that's been in the news uh, a great deal uh, uh, recently because of the uh, possibility of using these substances as therapeutics. Well, the word itself is interesting and was coined way back in 1956 by a psychiatrist who emigrated to Canada from the UK, Humphrey Osman. And he made up this word from the Greek for mind and manifest. Because psychedelics are substances that do something, manifest something in, in the mind. And today there's a great deal of interest in this because of the possibility that they can do beneficial things for, for the mind. Well, we'll see whether or not this uh, actually holds true. Now, as soon as we mention psychedelics, I think for most people, the three letters that come to mind are LSD, because this is the most famous of all the psychedelics. Lysergic acid diethylamid is what it stands for. Well, our story here starts in a most unusual place. It starts with a fungus that grows on the rye plant. And this is the same rye that you, know, you use to make rye bread, and it can be contaminated by a fungus. And that fungus is known as the ergo uh, fungus. And it contains a number of compounds, as, as most natural substances, plants, hundreds of compounds. But what is common to all of the natural occurring toxins that are found in the ergo fungus is that they have a similar molecular framework. So they, all of the molecules in there have this sort of structure embedded in them. And the reason that this is interesting is because it has a structural similarity to serotonin. Now I know that for most people who are not familiar with organic chemistry, that doesn't, doesn't mean much. But if you take a look at this six member drink and that five member drink, you see that in serotonin as well. And that is the part of the molecule that fits into receptors on cells. So this is why LSD is, is interesting. Uh, now, LSD itself is not found in the, uh, in the fungus. We'll get to that in a moment. But the basic structure that you have here is also the basic structure of LSD. But anyway, the, the first time that there was uh, any concern about this ergo fungus was when it was connected to a condition known as St. Anthony's Fire. Now, St. Anthony's Fire first appeared in the Middle Ages when people were afflicted by a host of symptoms. They went into convulsions and gangrene oozed out from their, their body. They vomited. Uh, the women were susceptible to uh, abortion. And this is a toxic reaction to the fungus. And of course, in those days, they didn't know anything about toxicity. They didn't know that, you know, if the rye turned a little bit dark, you shouldn't be eating it. 
so this was the manifestation. Now, interesting enough, why is it called St. Anthony's Fire? Well, St. Anthony was a Christian um, saint or in, who lived in the 13th century. And apparently they thought that praying to St. Anthony was the answer to this affliction. That's why it came to be called St. Anthony's Fire. Well, St. Anthony is interesting. He's revered by you know, Catholics uh, around the world. And there are all kinds of, of Catholic relics that are worshiped. What you see there is a piece of his rib, supposedly. And that travels around the world and uh, makes stops in Catholic churches where people can revere it. But uh, the uh, most interesting uh, part is, or of, of the story is in Padua in Italy, in this uh, cathedral, which is the home of his body, is, is buried there. But you know, Catholics like all kinds of icons. And here is one, this is in that basilica there. This is St. Anthony's jaw. And apparently after he was buried in the 13th century, later on he was exhumed. And the only part of his body uh, that remained in one piece was his jaw and his tongue. And both of these can be viewed in that cathedral, if you so wish. But also connected to the ergo fungus is the famous story of the Salem witch trials in 1692 when 21 people were executed, uh, 20 of them were hanged. One of them was crushed to death by putting stones on, on his chest because these 21 had been accused of being witches by the little girls of the town. Well, one theory here, which was put forward in a graduate school thesis, is that the climactic conditions that summer were such that the rye was contaminated with the fungus. And the little girls, who of course had the small body weight, were the most affected by eating rye, which was a staple at that time, and that they had hallucinations. And it was those hallucinations that caused them to you know, look at uh, some of these people in the town as, as witches. It's a very, very sad uh, kind of a story. Uh, I, I, I got to tell you, though, that although this has been widely reported in the press and is often talked about, uh, it is not something that is universally accepted in the scientific realm that this is the case. But anyway, it makes for an interesting story. What we do know scientifically is that in the early part of the 19th century, Dr. John Stearns found a use for an extract of the ergo fungus. In uh, parturition, you know what parturition is? No, childbirth. So it is childbirth, and it reduced any bleeding after childbirth. And interesting enough, this was put into use. And in the early part uh, of the 19th uh, uh, of the 20th century, ergo extracts were prescribed to women who had a history of, of bleeding after, the, after childbirth. But where this story gets really interesting is with the introduction of Dr. Albert Hoffman, who in 1938 began to explore the ergo fungus very much in the way that the pharmaceutical industry does today. When you find use for a substance, as I just showed you that they, they had, they found a use for ergo in, in childbirth. What you then try to do is improve on it. So he was trying to make some derivative of the chemicals found in the ergo fungus to see if these could be used medicinally. And he synthesized a variety of compounds that had a similarity in molecular structure. And one of the compounds that he synthesized was LSD because it had a basic framework like what was found in the ergo fungus. Well, it turned out that it didn't appear to have any kind of medical use. And essentially it was shelved. 
The only thing that Hoffman noted in his notebooks, as we later found out, that when animals were given this new compound that he had uh, synthesized, they became anxious and started to run all over the, the, the cage. But they didn't think very much of that. And he basically left this stuff alone for years, five years. And in 1943, he thought he would go back to this because by this time, others had been getting into trying to make derivatives of the ergo chemicals to use. So he thought that there might be some potential uh, here. And he noted one day after he had synthesized this compound, that all of a sudden he looked around and he saw colors like he had never seen before. And he described the vivid colors. He didn't know what was going on, but he thought that maybe he had somehow contaminated himself with the chemical that he was making and that this was the cause. And he decided to explore this further. So on April 19th, 1943, which turns out to be a historic moment in this area of research, he thought that he must have before accidentally ingested some of this and caused the colorful hallucinations. And now he was going to see whether or not this was the case. So he purposefully took some LSD and he described what happened in his notebook. Here it is, April 19, 1943. See, he prepared some lysergic acid diethylamide, and uh, by five o'clock, some dizziness, unrest, etc. And he went on to say that he was kind of struggling to get out his uh, his words, and that it was time to go home. The transportation was by bicycle. That's how he had come to work as you can see at the bottom. So he hopped on the bicycle to go home. And as it turned out, he was in for the ride of his life. Why? Because as he described it, he started to have these feelings on his bike trip, but by the time that he got home, it had materialized into all of this. He was hallucinating, he was having strange kind of feelings, his body felt like it was, it was plastic. Well, that day is still commemorated today by researchers in psychedelics and by historians who know the story of, of Hoffman and by ordinary people who experiment with psychedelics. That day is remembered as bicycle day because he went home on the bicycle where he had this trip well, he had more than one kind of trip. Right? He had the bicycle trip and he had the LSD trip. And this has now given way to a whole industry where people make artwork around this jewelry uh, to commemorate that bicycle day. You can even buy t-shirts uh, and there's Hoffman on his bicycle. Well, of course, given that he noticed this effect. He wanted to do some more research to see what was going on here. And he looked at the molecular structure of um, uh, LSD, and he found that it was similar to serotonin. Now, at that time, serotonin was already known to be a neurotransmitter, one of these chemicals that, that sends messages between nerve cells, which is interesting, of course. Uh, because drugs that interfere with that have potential uh, application. Uh, and uh, the pharmaceutical company for which uh, he, uh, for Hoffman works, Sandoz company in Switzerland, uh, decided that they would give some try to see whether or not LSD had any kind of an effect. And they did some exploratory research. And here was a sample of LSD. This was not commercialized. It was only research. It was given out to some doctors to see what uh, uh, effect it might have. But nothing was found. No, nothing useful was found at that time about uh, LSD. So it went back on the shelf. But then Hoffman got into another interesting area. 
Now, this was later. And he got a package in the mail because he already had a name, made a name for himself because of all of this research on, on LSD. He got a package in the mail of some small mushrooms. Well, those mushrooms were sent to him by Gordon Wassa, who was an amateur mycologist. Mycologists are people who look into fungi, fungi especially mushrooms. He was not a trained scientist. He had just developed an interest uh, in this, uh, collecting all kinds of mushroom-related memorabilia, as, as you can see. And he had written a book about the wonders of these mushrooms, which he learned had been used widely in South America. And he even investigated this personally. He managed to have a session with Maria Sabina, who was a natural healer, uh, sort of a witch doctor type. But she would give people magic mushroom, as it was called. And um, Wesson investigated this. Uh, he became very familiar with the mythology and with the history. And he realized that the Aztecs and the Mayans had long been using this mushroom. And they had even you know, made statues uh, for this. Now, this was something that was not highly regarded by the Spanish conquistadores. And Drake tried to suppress the use of uh, these mushrooms, calling it the work of, of the devil. But anyway, uh, uh, this amateur mycologist was interested enough in this to try to explore this further. And he knew about the work of Hoffman on LSD, knew that he was a scientist who was interested in such things. So he sent the, a sample of these uh, mushrooms uh, to him and uh, Hoffman went to work on it and determined the molecular structure of the chemical that was present in these uh, mushrooms. And that was a molecular structure. And interestingly enough, he quickly recognized that this compound, which he called psilocybin, uh, was similar to his lysergic acid. It had some similarity in molecular uh, structure. Uh, so psilocybin is the active ingredient in the mushroom that we call the psilocybe uh, mushroom. And uh, obviously, uh, Hoffman was interested in, in this because of his work with LSD. You know, you have something that gives you hallucinations, you have another similar chemical that was also known to give hallucinations. So obviously, the similarity in molecular structure was of some importance. Well, also, what, what is of interesting importance is the very first drawing that he ever made after he had determined the molecular structure, there it is in his notebook, and it just sold last year for eight hundred ninety-nine dollars, uh, hand hand-drawn uh, molecular structure. Well, at that time, there was a lot of talk of uh, this magic mushroom business, to the extent that he even made it into Life magazine, which at that time was the hottest magazine. And as you can see up there, the discovery of mushrooms that cause strange visions. And indeed, that is exactly what those mushrooms uh, did. Well, one of the scientists who read this article in Life magazine and got interested in the mushroom idea was Timothy Leary who Nixon called the most dangerous man in America. Why? Because he would, of course, go on to promote the use of hallucinatory substances, and that did not sit well with, uh, with Nixon. Uh, Nixon was a very interesting character. Uh, you know, he was uh, uh, sort of a Jekyll and Hyde. And he, Nixon did some very, very good things. But then, of course, he got caught up in the whole Watergate thing. Uh, but uh, he was very much against the use of any kind of uh, hallucinogenic substances. Anyway, Timothy Leary at that time was a professor at Harvard. And he was a legitimate psychologist. So he got into 
using hallucinogens. At first, he concentrated on psilocybin, and he made quite a name for himself with what we now know as the Concord Prison Experiment. There was a huge problem at that time, problem that still occurs today, about prisoners who are released and who eventually end up back in prison again. And he studied this and concluded that a combination of psychotherapy with psilocybin, the active ingredient in, in the mushroom, reduced the chance that a prisoner would once again end up in, in prison. It improved behavior. So this was a, a very legitimate study. However, he did some things that were not so legitimate. He then got into experimenting with LSD. And uh, he started to give some to his students, which is not the kind of thing that a university professor should be doing. And uh, LSD at that time really took off in the counterculture community, the hippies, as they were then called. Uh, this was the era of Woodstock when LSD was taken because it was supposed to open mind. And, you know, there, it was at the very heart of all the anti-war protests. It's interesting that those two things were tied, tied together. And um, all kinds of people were doing LSD at that time, including the Beatles. And, you know, one of their famous albums was Loose in the Sky with Diamonds. And you probably heard this, this story that uh, it was so called because of, uh, you know, allusion to uh, LSD. Picture yourself in a boat on a river with tangerine trees and marmalade sky. Again, obviously, so they say, description of hallucinations. Somebody calls you, answer quite slowly, a girl with kaleidoscope eyes, cellophane flowers of yellow and green towering over your head. Look for the girl with the sun in her eyes, and she's gone. Lucy in the sky with diamonds. And there, of course, you have the uh, reference to LSD. Uh, the, the Beatles never really commented on that, whether or not that, that really was the, uh, the story with, uh, with LSD. But as you can see from kind of description, it really looks like they're describing uh, hallucinations. Anyway, um, uh, he got into trouble because of this. Uh, he did. Uh, you don't give hallucinogenic substances to your students. And uh, for this, he and a colleague were fired from uh, Harvard. And that made for a big story at that time. But among the countercurrent culture community, he then became a hero, giving lectures all over the place. And with his famous phrase, turn on, tune in, drop out. Hard to know exactly what that meant, but uh, you know, give up your normal life because that's not the way to go. You want to get into drugs, you want to open your mind, and LSD was supposed to do that. And this also was the time that John Lennon and Yoko Ono had their celebrated bed in here in, in Montreal, the 1969. And who should show up in the room on the 17th floor of the Queenie? Tell Timothy Leary. There he is. And he piped in when they recorded their famous song, Give Peace a Chance, which they recorded in that room. Who played the guitar? Tommy Smothers. Who else was there? Another famous singer. Tommy Sermago is there, but he's not a famous singer. <laughs> I was there too. I'll give you a clue. Downtown. Petula Clark, yeah. Petula Clark was there singing uh, away as well. And uh, there's, of course, John and, and, uh, and Yoko. Well, eventually, uh, Hoffman ended up writing a book about LSD, calling it his problem child. So he recognized that you know, there were issues with, uh, with LSD. 
but he kept taking small doses himself for the rest of his life. And what happened to him? He lived to 102. And the age of 100, uh, artist Alex Gray uh, painted this picture of, uh, of Hoffman uh, for his 100th birthday. So there you go. If you want to live long, take LSD. But that's what we call anecdotal evidence. Yeah. Now, remember at the beginning, I told you that the word uh, psychedelic was coined by Dr. Humphrey Osmond. Well, Osmond was a British-born uh, physician who emigrated to Canada, and it did a lot of work here. And he became very interested in hallucinogenic substances. He became interested in LSD, and more specifically, he became interested in mescaline. Now, mescaline is found in a type of cactus known as the peyote. It grows in South America, Central America, and in the Southern US. And this too has a long history of use by natives, the Aztecs and, and the Mayans. Lots of descriptions about using uh, peyote. Now, of course, they didn't know what the active ingredient was. But by the time that hot, that uh, uh, the Canadian doctor got interested in it, the active ingredient was known to be mescaline. And he started to wonder whether or not certain mental illnesses may be due to chemicals that are naturally produced in the body. Why wonder about that? Because he noticed that mescaline's molecular structure was similar to that of adrenaline, which of course we find in their body, in our body. So he wondered what is going on here? How come that a substance that causes all these delusions is similar to something found in the body? So he wondered whether or not mental illness was due to some chemical in the body going astray, either in terms of high concentrations or, or low concentrations. So he wondered whether or not mental illness could be some sort of auto-intoxication. That is, were people being poisoned on the inside because their body was producing some sort of substance that was similar to hallucinogens that are found in plants. He was kind of on the right track, but he focused in on the wrong substance because schizophrenia, which is the prime mental illness, is caused by the body producing too much dopamine. And dopamine is similar to mescaline in molecular structure. So he was on the, on the right track. And in fact, turns out that the very first drug that was ever used to treat schizophrenia, which is chlorpromazine, Thorazine is a dopamine blocker. So that research really stemmed from the realization that nature produces compounds such as mescaline, which are similar to substances found in the body. Well, it turns out that this issue really intrigued Aldous Huxley, famous writer by 1953. Famous, of course, for having written Brave New World. And he wanted to try some mescaline. Thought this would be interesting and, and mind opener. Well, he gave it a try under proper supervision. And he wrote a book, The Doors of Perception, in which he described what happened to him when he experimented with these substances. And he found that mescaline really did do a job on him. He did have hallucinations, but he also claimed that it opened up his mind, that he was a better writer with it. Uh, Aldous Huxley is an interesting guy. I, I, I like him because of one of his quotes Facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored, which is a great quote. 
And as you know, it applies to so many things in, in uh, uh, modern life. You know, people just don't abide by the facts. Uh, they have all kinds of, you know, uh, illusions about what is going on in the world. And of course, we've seen this with all of the nonsense that was generated during uh, COVID. So facts do not cease to exist because they're ignored is, is, is a great quote. He also came up with something else. He came up with a word, a word that he invented for substances that had this mind-altering effect. So he said, to make this mundane world sublime, just half a gram of phenothiothine. And uh, Humphrey Osmond retorted with, to fall in hell or soar angelic, you need a pinch of psychedelic. And the word psychedelic, uh, is the one that, of course, has remained in use. When Huxley was dying, he said that he wanted the transition to be smooth to the afterlife. He didn't want to suffer. And uh, there it is. As you can see, his wish was uh, to be given LSD, which he was. And he went quite peacefully. Now, having said all of this about, you know, the intriguing things about LSD and mescaline and, and psilocybin, the fact is that these substances are illegal. The government sometimes looks the other way when, you know, people are found with small amounts of this. But if you're found, you know, trying to extract or make some of these things in, at home in some, you know, uh, clandestine laboratory, uh, that of course is, is a crime. Now where this really becomes interesting is that these days there's a great deal of medical attention that is being paid to the use of these substances. Mental illness is pervasive uh, and it has grown since uh, COVID. So the question is, are there drugs that can be re use, really useful in treating mental disease? And today, there is a lot of attention being paid to these mind-altering substances, which is, of course, reasonable, because mental illness is an alteration of the mind, and maybe these substances can have a role. So the so-called promise of the psychedelics, which is being investigated now, is whether or not they can play a role in alleviating depression, addiction, OCD, and anxiety at the end of life, which is obviously a big problem when people are getting near the end, and especially if they are suffering from some, some illness with a lot of pain, uh, what can you do? Uh, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of ethical discussions about this, about uh, whether or not someone can decide to put an end, uh, end to it. But even without that, uh, without sort of you know, uh, physician-assisted suicide, as it is called, can you do something to ease the transition by taking some sort of mind-altering substance to essentially get your mind off the fact that you're going to die. So th this is something that is, you know, being um, investigated. And I want to tell you some of the latest research in this area, because uh, it's interesting and there is likely something that will come out of this. It actually are, all starts with the work of Dr. Stanislas Groff, who was a Czech immigrant to North America. And he had a number of positions in North America, but eventually ending up at a private university in California called the California Institute of Integral Studies. And his main interest was in studying whether or not hallucinogenic or psychedelic substances can be beneficial. So in 1973, he published a landmark paper LSD-assisted psychotherapy in patients with terminal cancer. The idea was to see whether or not their anxiety could be relieved 
by taking small amounts of, of LSD. Now, it is, of course, possible to titrate the dose of LSD so that you get some effect without having the classic hallucinations that were described by Hoffman. So this is what he did. He, he used uh, different doses, but always very, very small doses. And he found that 70% of subjects reduced emotional and physical distress. That is, they were much, much less anxious. They were much more at peace with what was going to happen. Now, it doesn't work in everyone. Uh, nothing works in everyone, no matter what kind of drug you are talking uh, about. But this is 1973 is, is kind of the a landmark year for the beginning of the study of psychedelics and uh, uh, medical uses. Uh, Dr. Charles Grobe at UCLA School of Medicine, uh, which is, of course, a, a top notch school, uh, followed up uh, on this. Now, there have been other papers published in between, but it was in 2011 that he got a lot of attention with a study that he did with zilocybin. Now, zilocybin is the stuff that we have in the magic uh, mushroom. And he wanted to explore whether or not using psilocybin as a treatment for anxiety in patients with advanced stage cancer. Now, people with advanced stage cancer, of course, very often suffer pain, and they also have a great deal of anxiety, obviously. So the question was, could psilocybin do anything for this? And the answer was, yeah, there was a positive trend toward improved mood and reduced anxiety without causing any sort of uh, hallucination. So what, of course, you always want to do when you are intervening medically is to make sure that you don't do any harm. So you don't want to give a, a drug that is, 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 is going to make people crazy with hallucinations. But it turned out that the zilocybin uh, was just, they, they could find just the right, right dose. And then Dr. Stephen Ross at NYU, New York State University, who is still very, very active in this uh, area of, of, of research, uh, studied psilocybin for anxiety, depression, uh, once more in patients with life-threatening uh, cancer. And here is a, a key word here randomized controlled trial. And that's what we look for in, in science. You don't look for anecdotal evidence, you know, people's stories about, you know, what happened to them when they took something. I mean, that can always be interesting and it can serve as a springboard for further research. But if you want to get any real results, what we always look for is randomized, controlled, double-blind trials. This is the gold standard in science. What you want to do is take two, take a large group of people, randomly divide them into two groups. That's important. I mean, you don't, you know, you don't want all people over 50 in one group and all under 50 in the other group. We're all males, they're all females. So you want random. So you have two random groups. And you're going to give whatever you're trying to one group and a placebo to the other group, basically a, a sugar pill. But nobody knows who is getting what. So neither the subjects who are involved in the study nor the experimenters know who's taking what. So that there's no bias that is in, involved. And only people who are statisticians who are running the trial know the codes that eventually can reveal who was getting what. So interesting enough, single moderate dose of psilocybin produce rapid, robust, and enduring anti-anxiety and antidepressant effects, which is exactly what you want to, to see. So the evidence, as you can see, is, is accumulating about the potential benefits of using these substances 
for anxiety conditions and for near end of life. And then Dr. Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins University, uh, again, of course, one of the prime universities in the world. And you know, when, when you look at a study, there are several things that you look at uh, to determine you know, uh, how valid the study is. Uh, you do look to see where the researcher is. You know, it, 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 uh, it makes a difference if they are at Harvard or at, at some state university. Not that there's anything wrong with a state university, but, but you know that, that Harvard is much more selective in who they hire and they have a lot more money, et cetera. So you look to see where the study is, is coming from and it's coming from a named university, you pay more, uh, more attention to it. Then the next thing that you look at, at least I always do, is who funded the study. Now, it doesn't mean that if someone has a vested interest in the study, that you dismiss the study, right? Because the truth is that it is only going to be people who have a potential you know, uh, benefit from a study who are going to fund it. I mean, let's face it, if, you know, if you're going to study something about psychedelics, and you want to look for some funding, and these days, you know, funding is tough to come by. Government funding has been cut way back. So who do you look for? Are you going to look for funding from a pharmaceutical company or from a light bulb manufacturer, right? Well, it's obvious. I mean, <laughs> you the only people who are going to be interested in funding such a study are the ones who have something potentially to, to gain. But... It doesn't mean that you dismiss the study. It does mean that you look at it, you know, with a bit more scrutiny. And the real problem here actually is not what you may find in a study that was funded by a vested interest. The trouble is a study that never gets published because the findings were not what the vested interest would like to have had. Okay, so that's a that's a different kind of uh, of an issue, but anyway, you know, once once you uh, take a look at who's doing the research, who funded uh, the research, whether it was properly randomized, double blind, etc., uh, there's one other thing you look at, and that is the so-called impact factor of the journal, and that is something that we look at in science all the time. The impact factor of a journal is determined by the number of people who make references to an article that was published in that journal. So for example, the New England Journal of Medicine would have an extremely high impact factor because it is read by researchers around the world who use whatever information is in there to further the research and they reference the paper. But you can also look at something like the Ayurvedic Medicine Journal of India, you know, which might have an impact factor of one, which is nothing. Uh, and they may just publish anything that is submitted to them. Uh, but chances are that you know, someone who works at Johns Hopkins is going to publish in a high impact uh, journal uh, anyway. So Dr. Roland Griffiths is, uh, you know, a big mover and shaker in this, this area. And in 2016, psilocybin produces substantial and sustained decreases in depression and anxiety in patients with life-threatening cancer. Again, the key, randomized double-blind trial. We pay attention to that. High-dose psilocybin produced large decreases in clinical and self-rated measures of depressed mood and anxiety increased optimism and decrease in death anxiety. Just what you know what you would like to see in, in a medication. Sort of a sad um, ending to this story is that he himself has been diagnosed with terminal cancer and is basically making use of the information that he discovered in his study. So he is taking, right now, he's taking small doses of uh, acetylcybin and is at uh, peace with what is uh, going to happen. 
So as you can see, studies are, are piling up. And these days, there are more and more that are being uh, published. Now, here's a very interesting one. It's in the New England Journal of Medicine, which means that you know, we look at it very seriously. New England Journal of Medicine has uh, probably the highest rejection rate uh, of any journal in the world. Uh, it's a, I forget what it now is, something like one out of 40. One out of 40 papers that are submitted gets published. It doesn't mean that the other 39 are junk because people don't submit to the New England Journal junk. They, they know that you know this is a highly refereed journal and, and stuff to get anything in there. So when you do manage to get something in there, you know that it is going to be uh, pretty impactive. Um, note, though, the number of researchers involved in this study. And these days, you tend to see that a lot. There's a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, collaboration. So what they find? Psilocybin at a single dose, 25 milligrams, but not 10 milligrams, reduced depression scores significant more than a one milligram dose over three weeks. So here now we are uh, learning something else that you know we want to know about. We're getting into the dosage, not just whether or not something works or not, but how much one would have to take, take to uh, have, uh, have an effect. 2022 is followed by another study of uh, xilocybin in major depressive disorder, a placebo-controlled double-blind randomized trial. That's exactly what we want to see. Single moderate dose psilocybin significantly reduced depressive symptoms for two weeks. Again, you know, positive. Uh, Depression seems to uh, have, you know, be affected by uh, uh, acetos, psilocybin. So as the evidence is accumulating, there is another aspect to this that is now becoming uh, subject of much discussion, and that is what we refer to as microdosing. That is, is it possible? that very small amounts of these psychedelic substances taken, even if you're not overtly suffering from anything, can they improve the quality of your life? Well, there's, as you can see, already a great deal of information that is available here. And this whole concept of microdosing was started in 2011 by James Fadiman, a, a psychologist and with his publication of this explorer's uh, guide. And um, his contention was that the psychedelics, if used wisely, uh, can have all kinds of beneficial effect for everyday life. Not only people at the end of their life or people suffering from depression, but just to generally improve the quality of life. Now, by microdosing, what is meant is taking a very small percent of the kind of doses that we were talking about before. I mean, we're not talking about what Hoffman himself was taking LSD or the psilocybin stores. Very, very small amounts in the microgram area. And uh, his expectation was that uh, uh, psilocybin mushrooms or the extracted psilocybin uh, taken a couple of times a week are going to have an impact on, uh, on life. The promise of microdosing, as now discussed in many books and many papers, is a general improved well being, better cognitive function, people become more creative, and uh, sort of just better memory, feeling smarter, etc. Uh, kind of interesting. And here's one statement that they like to make. It's not what you feel, it's what you don't feel. So it will rid you of anxiety, of anger, and depression. Of course, the question we ask, where is the evidence? Do we have proper studies for microdosing? Well, there are some. Here's one in 2019. Might microdosing psychedelics be safe and beneficial? An initial exploration. Well, this initial exploration found 
improved mood, antidepressant effect. This was by James Fadiman, the guy who wrote the original book. Improved attention, hyperactivity disorder, better productivity, less procrastination, more patient with family members. Which journal is it saying? Good question. We can look back. It's there at the top. Okay, it is in the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs, which is a respectable journal. It is not the New England Journal of Medicine, and the New England Journal of Medicine would not have accepted this study. Why? Because it is basically anecdotal. What Fadiman asked people to do around the world, he wrote articles in magazines, newspapers, soliciting people to send in their own case reports, people who were microdosing and what they found the effect was. Now, this is anecdotal evidence, and this is, uh, is not good enough for you know, one of the top-notch uh, journals. But the fact is that he had thousands and thousands of people send in their reports. So it means that you know, there is probably uh, something here. There also was no effect on chronic pain. So this is not something that, uh, you know, that will uh, improve uh, chronic pain, which is what a lot of people are struggling with. So that's sort of anecdotal. But then we get to this. Uh, this was a very interesting study, and it actually was a, a, a blinded study. It was very cleverly uh, organized. And it was in a, a very, uh, very good journal. And... Uh, People were told to take either a placebo or their microdosing drug and keep track of all of the effects, and they would report this on a daily basis. All psychological outcomes improved significantly, interesting, after four weeks, but there was no difference between the experimental and the placebo groups, which is, of course, also important. Uh, you know. Then finally, in 2022, Harriet DeWitt, who is one of the major researchers in this area, she looked at LSD, repeated low dose of LSD in healthy adults, once again, a placebo-controlled study. And 26 micrograms, very small dose of LSD, produced modest subjective effects, but negligible changes in mood or uh, cognition. So not an overwhelming uh, response. But it certainly means that this stuff is worth exploring, and the Canadian government agrees with that. Just last couple of weeks ago, Canadian government came out with uh, this notice that they're going to invest, as you can see, $3 million to study the potential benefits of zelocybin-assisted psychotherapy. We are one of the, the uh, few countries in the world who are now doing very serious research in this. But the country who is at the top of this game right now is Australia, because in Australia, doctors are already allowed, allowed to prescribe psilocybin and MDMA, methylene dioxide, methamphetamine, uh, which is uh, uh, a drug that is often taken by teenagers at raves. It's a, a clandestine uh, dr drug. Uh, and uh, as you can see in, in Australia, it now is, uh, is allowed. It's controversial, uh, as you can imagine, but we'll see what, what happens. I mean, there is enough evidence to, to do this, to you know, pursue this, uh, because uh, I, I would say that you know, there's a lot of smoke, and while there not, may not be a raging inferno, there is some fire there. Uh, there is enough evidence with the use of, of uh, uh, these drugs to, to explore this uh, further. But in Canada, it's essentially still illegal, but there is a very significant black market. 
for the use of uh, psilocybin, use of LSD. Now, this black market isn't exactly totally secret because you can go online and you can buy magic mushroom in various different guises. Now, whether or not it actually contains that, who the hell knows? You know, I mean, this is the, the, the big risk that you take with everything that you're buying, you know, in supplement form. This doesn't apply only to uh, psychedelics. I mean, this applies to all, you know, all the herbal supplements, etc. cetera. You, you don't know whether or not it can be uh, trusted. But as I said, it's not a secret, uh, you know, that there's this black market to the extent that there are even stores that are openly selling this stuff. And depending on where the store is, the, the local government either ignores it or, or not. In Vancouver, they tend to mostly ignore it. So there are these mushroom dispensaries in, in Vancouver where you can actually not only buy uh, psilocybin uh, or the mushrooms, but there's a menu. Just like here, you know, with the cannabis stores, there are many versions. So you can buy different kinds of, of uh, psilocybin uh, mushrooms. And there's a company in Canada called the Fun Guys, which is a very clever name, right? It's a play on fungi, of course. Very clever. And they are going to open up stores across the country and essentially defy the law. And because they want to bring it out in the open, they want court cases, etc. And you may have seen in the news um, last week a uh, story in Montreal, and there was a fun guy's uh, store. There's a fun guy trying to get in. Uh, and the uh, the police cracked down, and uh, they they took away all of the, the the plastered things. You know, they stripped off the pictures, etc. Uh, but the guy says that he's going to reopen uh, because he wants to be uh, in court. He wants to challenge the the law. So right now, the, you can't get it, you know, openly in Montreal, but there is a place that still advertises. And it's the Psilocybin Shroom Shop. And if you drive down there, this is, it is in, as you can see where it is in old Montreal. And there it is. That's the address I know because I went there to check it out. Uh, they were closed. I, I, I couldn't get in. Uh, so I don't know what this is, uh, what they are actually selling. But as you can imagine, there are a lot of people today who are looking for that trip of a lifetime uh, for various reasons. Some of it is because they kind of want to get high. But as you can see, some is, is for medical uh, reasons. I told you the story of uh, John and Yoko in 1969. And we actually have a memorial in Montreal to that. Anyone know where that is? It's on Mount Royal. If you walk up Peel Street, you know that there's steps at the end of Peel Street where you go up to the mountain? Well, if you walk up there, you will walk across this, which does not at first strike you as being a memorial or, a, or you know, uh, some sort of artwork at all, until you look down and you look closely. And this is what it is. It's, uh, I think it's in 50 different languages. And uh, it, it says, give peace a chance. So we have this rather unique memorial to that, uh, uh, that event. So that's the story of uh, psychedelics. And I, I think you appreciate that it's an interesting one. And it's an evolving one. You know, we'll see where, where this goes, but I, I suspect that it won't be long 
before we see prescription doses of uh, psilocybin for anxiety, for depression, and for uh, end of life uh, anxiety. And all, you know, traces back basically to uh, native lore in South America, which then was exploited mostly by Albert Hoffman, who um, uh, really is, is, was the prime investigator, original investigator of, uh, of LSD. All right, any queries? Yeah. Wasn't the, the research being done by the American Army in the 1940s and stuff? Oh yeah, both, both the American Army and the Canadian Army did research on, on psychedelics um, and on amphetamines. Uh, but it uh, it wasn't for uh, you know hallucinatory purposes. It was for increased strength and dealing with battlefield anxiety. They did, but it was never put into use in the uh, LS, neither LSD or psilocybin. Although they were researched by the army, was never implemented. Yeah. What is the morality? Or you said. Uh, I think it was spotted with somebody. They did research and they found that it reduced anxiety or whatever uh, close to death people. Yeah. What is the morality of doing studies on people who are close to death? Well, I'm not sure that morality comes into it. I mean, you want to, to improve how they deal with the with the, the but at the time you study, you don't know what you Sure. I mean, these studies are done in hospitals where, you know, people are in terminal stage. Yeah. I mean, it, the fact is that at that stage, you know, we can, you can't do too much harm. So, yeah. Sorry? Pain. Yes, I mean, a pain, of course, uh, exacerbates all kinds of anxiety. Um, so there's no question that, that when people suffer from pain, the first thing you need to do is to deal with that. That's why, you know, it's so ridiculous that, that when people have pain and they're suffering from some terminal condition, that they, they even think about addiction. Uh, and I mean, you know, I've, I've seen that. <laughs> you, you have, you know, people who are suffering terribly and you know that the title of morphine would be very useful. And they say, well, you know, do you want your relative to become addicted to morphine? I mean, this is stupid, you know. Uh, you can always control the dose, I mean, the, Treating pain is more important than any of this this stuff. That's for sure, and and it can be done. I mean, you know, there's very good drugs for pain. Yeah. And you no, uh, at the at the doses, especially doses that we're talking about, the micro dosing. You're talking micrograms. There's, no one has noted side effects. The side effect is that it may not do anything. That's the side effect. Yes, when when uh, with zelocybin, when you're using it on terminal cancer patients in the in the bigger dose, twenty five milligram doses, you can get hallucinations, which, which some people interpret as, you know, unacceptable side effects. But but there's no physiological effect. There's no, nothing that is physically going to make you more ill. So I think that this is a classic uh, search for the happy children. You do what help. It's been going on for decades. But I have two questions. Uh, what, would, what would be likely to happen more and more sooner, uh, a pill in, in the form of psilocybin or LSD. My first question, and, and uh, the drug companies right now that are that are manufacturing and issuing the uh, 
SSRIs for depression. You think they're going to get into it? Is there going to be in a sense? They're going to use this as competition. Oh, of course, it's the same companies. <laughs> it's the same companies. But but um, with uh, LSD, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, LSD has too much baggage. Uh, you know, uh, people uh, perceive it as as being a problem, which it, they may not be. But psilocybin, sure, we're going to see that as a prescription drug. And uh, uh, of course, it's going to be big pharma who who does it. And uh, it's not it's not going to cut into the SSRI market. That this. I, I think that the uh, the first major use is going to be in, in cases of end stage of, of life. That's not where you would use the SSRIs anyway. So it's a, I don't think it's going to be a competition. Yeah. My eventual, my eventual well, that's the micro dosing. That's the micro dosing. And uh, that is, it, it, it's really too early to jump on that back. I mean, there's something, something there uh, that needs a lot more evidence. But the the non micro dosing, the somewhat larger dosing, there, I think that's significant. Yeah. Is this uh, with the available online? Well, the the magic mushroom is available online right now. Yeah. Except you don't know what you you don't know what you're getting. In a similar way as you presented. Yes. Yeah. You can you can buy it right now. You can go home and order it online. Be happy tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, uh, the question about uh, uh, psilocybin mushrooms. How expensive? Not expensive. They they grow very easily. They any sort of wet climate uh, they grow. Uh, the uh, campus, uh, University of British Columbia, beautiful campus on the ocean. Magic mushroom grows there all the time, and in the uh, in the spring, which is when they first come out, and you see students crawling around on their knees. And they're not praying. Yeah. Prevagen, very easy answer. Absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. They, they, those people should be in jail. How they get away with with this is ridiculous. And uh, of course, they've you know they've had class action lawsuits. They have fines by FDA. They paid the fine. They settled the class action lawsuits because they're making so much money. Question Prevagen, which is this uh, supplement that is supposed to improve your memory, totally ridiculous. We have an online question about DMT. DMT, yeah, dimethyltryptamine, uh, which is uh, also one of these hallucinogens, which is uh, extracted from the morning glory, which is a, a plant, and. Uh, uh, there right now there there are no uses for DMT. DMT is a classic uh, underground drug sold on the street. Uh, it uh, behaves like serotonin, so you know there may be something to it in uh, in the future. But right now it's just it's an illegal substance. Psychiatrists are very up to date on this because this is, you know, in, in their area. Yeah. I think you're, you know, this is not something that's going to be prescribed by your family doctor. All right. So we'll see you next month. I don't remember exactly what the date is, but it's a, whatever the first Monday in August is.